In this video, I focus on deploying simulation to answer questions that arise during a construction site visit or to the offices of a design team. Let's call this in situ simulation. So here's the scene. I was in an engineer's site office. As I was offered a cup of coffee, I overheard staff debating which of three competing ceiling heating schemes might be preferable for a ward of single occupant rooms in a hospital. Hey, tell me a bit more about that. Well, long story short, they believed that ceiling heating would free up some source space and avoid the dreaded no man's land of a perimeter trench heater. And it would provide quicker response time than a floor heating regime. And it would ensure that hot surfaces, yeah, the stuff you get off standard radiators, would be remote from the patients. But beyond the technical details of these three choices, it turned out that, well, hospital staff, they weren't so enthusiastic about this whole thing. They were worried about standing under those ceiling panels when they were doing the rounds. Everybody lacked a bit of information in order to help bring those hospital staff on side. And, well, it was a week away from the building services engineers being able to do their magic. Pulling out my laptop, I suggested, well, if they could supply me with some plans and sections and some layouts of the panels, and oh, where might people be in those rooms, maybe I could make a focused simulation model to help clarify how well those panels worked, as well as the comfort implications for the staff and patients. Wonderful idea. Hey, great. Um, uh, Actually, we're having a meeting a bit later on this afternoon. Um, could you have something ready for us by then? So, the clock starts ticking. Well, while I was planning the model, most of the information I needed arrived. Well, except they didn't have full specs on the panels. So, here's the model. I rendered it in Blender because that shows up the 3D character a lot easier than the wireframe view in the ESPR interface. Here's the approach I took. Three rooms, each reflecting the pro proposed panel regimes. And I also included the ceiling voids above and below because, well, ignoring boundary conditions near the heated panels, well, that's just introducing silly risk. Less of a concern is what was happening in adjacent spaces because, well, it's a hospital. Everything's likely to be controlled fairly tightly. I decided there was good reason to include furniture and fittings. First, their mass might actually alter the response characteristics of the room. And, well, comfort's related to what's warm nearby. And therefore, if the panels actually warmed other surfaces in the room that were close to the occupant, well, that might alter the comfort perceptions. Is this over the top? Well, not really. ESPR's got a database of furniture and fittings with both thermal and visual attributes. So it's a matter of pick one and place it. Pick one and place it. The main point is that everything in that room is thermophysically real. Everything fully participates in the thermal solution. About the ceiling heaters. I wasn't able to get everything I needed in order to set up the panels as detailed components. Perhaps detail components are an overkill. The critical attributes were response time and surface temperature, as well as the ability to distribute heat properly within the space. What I chose to do is create a heating panel that's really a thin bounded zone, into which I'm going to inject some heat. Sides are going to be insulated, and the lower surface is going to basically track the temperature of the working fluid. And I can describe all of that by way of a thermal zone, so it's at the same level of resolution as everything else in the model. So let's delve into these rooms in the ASPR interface. Here's the model, the three rooms, along with the bounding zones above and below. If we go into it and have a look at the composition, there are 
eight zones defined in here. One for each of the main rooms, uh, plus the plenum above, the plenum below, and th one zone each to represent the radiant panels themselves. Here's the initial room where we have the room and then we see surface going along the left and along the front at the facade. And that's the lower surface of the heater. So inside we have some furniture as well as the bed. And then there are these blocks here that represent the mean radiant temperature sensors, which we are going to use to evaluate comfort at a specific position. So we have various surfaces in here with their composition and their boundary requirements. And if I go to radiant panel, so I get that highlighted and it's made out of a thing called aluminium panel. And it faces a zone called RAD 400 and a particular surface in there. If I move to the next zone, here's the plenum above, which has ceilings attached to the rooms below, plus the upper and side surfaces of the various heater elements. Space below, again, the floors in each of the rooms, plus a bounding space, boundary temperatures and radiant environment underneath the rooms. Here's the middle one with a single panel running along the facade. Here's the heater for the first zone. That's its shape. So what will be happening in here is that we've set a very high heat transfer coefficient so that any heat that's injected into this very thin zone immediately gets transferred to the heating surface. Here's the zone representing the single heater at the facade. Same kind of things going on there. And the third room is identical to the middle one, except that the heater has been moved back slightly away from the facade. It's much closer to where staff will be standing and is closer to the head position of the patient in the room. We have defined view factors between all of the surfaces in the occupied spaces, as well as in the plenum and the lower plenum. And we have some controls that have been defined. In this case, there are three control loops. Uh, one is the controller for the first room, second controller for the middle room, and the third for its alternative. And essentially, uh, we're sensing that particular room, and then there are some data in the period which says that I sense uh, dry bulb temperature and I actuate flux in the heater room. So, in terms of convection coefficients, I have forced a definition within the radiant rooms themselves to make sure that the normal assumptions related to heat transfer coefficients are overridden. One other thing that's going on in the radiant temperature is if we go into the bed, it reads in the pre-calculated information, and then we see that there are these sensors that have been defined. So they have a position in space and a size. And with that information, we're able to do position-specific thermal comfort analysis. Having defined the model, 
One of the tricks of the trade is to spend time living with the model. You need to be able to understand it so that you can tell other people the story that you've evolved in looking at its performance. The second trick of the trade is, well, don't do an annual simulation when one week assessment would tell you if the design idea is rubbish. In this case, I chose February week to stress the design. This constrained not only the runtime, but it ensured that performance patterns were focused and more easily digestible. So, after a half hour of iterating assessments and tweaking the model, with that done, then it's time to get the designers and engineers involved. So, yeah, a quick overview of the model and give them the elevator pitch about what I discovered. And then, well, look, it's time to open up the performance data interface and say, what else would you like to know? Oh, popped a question. Is there any noticeable difference in the resources between these three panel variants in terms of being able to maintain the set point? What's it like inside those rooms? Let's go in and look at a graphical view. We're just going to focus on a couple of days in there in that first room. And here are the patterns of temperatures within the space. The red line in the middle is the dry bulb temperature. It's quite stable. The two lines below that are the window and the frame around the window. All the cluster of lines just above the red line, well, that's all the other surface temperatures in the room, except for the panel heater, and that's shown in black. That kicks on and ratchets a bit. P picking up, we reach set point, drops down, comes back up again, and so it responds sufficiently in temperature over time to maintain quite a tight dry bulb temperature inside the room. Changing focus to the middle room with the simple single panel at the facade, a lot of the patterns are very much similar, except that because the panel is slightly smaller, it's needing to run at a higher temperature uh, in order to maintain temperatures within that zone. The third room is one of those classic what if we shift the panel to be closer to the people in the room, and in terms of surface and air temperatures, there's essentially no differences. What does change is the mean radiant temperature calculated at the sensors located at the occupant head positions. The black lines in the figure indicate an initial 1 or 2 degrees C increment for the occupants in the L-shaped room. By the time we get to the second day, purple lines for the case of the setback single panel, well, those are about a degree warmer simply due to the position of that panel. Here's a graph of predicted mean vote. And there's not much change except for just a few hours of one day. If we look at percentage dissatisfied, especially related to asymmetrical discomfort, not much change, but when there is one in that alternative room with the panel much closer to the head of the staff, bang, we see it. So flipping from a graphical view to a stats view over the period, we can see the different patient and staff sensor maximum mean and standard deviations for that head to ceiling discomfort. Clearly, shifting that panel closer to where the staff are standing, it's not really a good idea. And here are some takeaways from this in-situ deployment of simulation. Listen for opportunities to contribute to the ongoing debate. Before you open up your laptop, imagine what kind of model would address the issues being discussed. Is there anything you can toss out of that imagined model that's not really necessary? What kind of information are you going to need from those other people? Can they deliver it? And for stuff that's not available, what kind of workaround could you slip in? Consider what would you hit that virtual twin with that would confirm 
that the designer's idea is not utter rubbish? And is there a way to reserve enough time to live with a model in order to understand those things? And what else could you look for during those explorations which would deliver on the next question they might ask?